my dog Dash. I mean, we got her when I, she was a puppy because I thought it helped me with, you know, my issues. I would choke her until her eyes would roll to the back of her head and then I'd let go, you know, at the last minute. I would fantasize and talk to my friend about how I was wanting to kill her and make it look like an accident so my wife wouldn't freak out. I would kick her uh, constantly. I'd throw her against the wall and I just had this anger over something that didn't deserve it. Even at that point, I didn't even realize I had a problem. film. Once I really start to get into the experience is really when I start to dive into the darkness. I remember this one lady, I think she was an interpreter. The bones in her hands were like poking out of her fingers, kind of like a, you know, you forcefully stick your hand through an old glove almost. One leg was completely the other way around. And she kept saying, if I'm, if one of my legs is messed up, or if I'm losing a leg, let me die. It was just a really surreal experience. I mean, I can't even go in to describe it. It's just, I don't know. And it's still like, yeah, I just kind of shut myself off at that point. The infantry element we were attached to lost one of their own. He was, a, you know, he was a 19-year-old, 19-year-old kid. Um, that was that was devastating because, again, like you, you run with these wolves, right? Like, I mean, emotional. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I mean, it's important to say it really is. Like, you, you really you see from the inside out, like the sacrifice they make, and like when they lose one of their own, like how devastating that is because like you, you take from the world like it's that's such an imp impressive asset that we, we've got and, and we lose it to something like this like he's a kid 19 years old like that's devastating just just to, just to witness it just to witness i mean their their tragic loss their i mean Sorry again. <laughs> so what's the next question? The Greeks called uh, what they became in, in war, they would call it the daemon. And the daemon was what they summoned so they could survive this, this thing that's not, it's inhumane. Well, that comes back with you. James was always just such an outgoing person. Once PTSD kind of sets in, like, you don't even know who you're married to anymore. I was so numb, I couldn't feel emotions. I didn't know how to retrieve them anymore. It was to the point where I knew I loved my wife with all my heart, but I couldn't feel it. I was afraid because I was pregnant a year ago. I was like, is my husband even going to be able to connect with his baby? What am I doing here? It's like, this, I don't think this is going to get better. As soon as I got back from deployment, I went skydiving uh, and broke my back. I had to kind of relearn to walk. I had to relearn how to, how to redevelop myself almost entirely. And I felt I was just getting depressed because that's what happens when you break your back. Well, maybe a byproduct of the pain medication or something. But it wasn't until about a year and a half later that after the insomnia had stacked up on top of itself, I had some rage outbursts. My poor mom had to like be the brunt of this whole thing. I mean, she understood kind of what was going, what was kind of happening. I didn't. So the, the VA is pretty good about at least assessing, getting you to, to actually see a psychotherapist who can try and give you something like SSRIs. I mean, I got up to taking six a day.
So after that, I was put in uh, this thing called alpha stimulation, which so they attach these electrodes to your earlobes and they shoot this electrical impulse to your brain. And I tried the exposure therapy. It was a TV showing you kind of pictures and glimpses of sort of combat footage. So once that failed, um, they put me in this group therapy program. It helped while I was doing it, but as immediately once I left, it was just almost an immediate relapse. I felt very weak. I mean, these were my own issues I was battling, and I couldn't get past them. And I was just angry that I was not making myself better. I was angry, because I know the doctor down the street's not gonna do anything. I know these meds aren't gonna do anything. Um, it's all me. I thought after six months or a year, if it's actually, it's, it was really actually getting worse. I mean, this, this was not, this isn't something that's getting better. And I was thinking in five years term, what's the point? Like, it really started to weigh on my mind that like, I, I, I really could make the decision to eat the gun. I could, I could do it in a way that my mom wouldn't find me and my dog would never find it because that's something, a trauma they shouldn't have to live through. So I learned about MAPS through watching the Joe Rogan podcast. There's a Rick Doblin episode. Rick Doblin founded MAPS. I went on the MAPS website and I just started looking at all these different research studies going on across the country. Then I saw Boulder, Colorado. Holy crap, that's where I was wanting to go to college. That's where I want to move when I get out. And I was one of the first to qualify, if not the first to qualify for the Boulder study because I had sought treatment elsewhere and it didn't work. The VA didn't work. Um, and that was really the, one of the prerequisite criteria for getting in the study. My family was not at all supportive. When my husband tells me that he wants to take ecstasy in a study, I'm like, you're crazy. MDMA is stigmatized as this party drug. You know, um, when I say Molly, when I say ecstasy, people think of kids doing it at raves, kids doing it at clubs, parties, et cetera, et cetera. MDMA is the active ingredient in what's commonly known as ecstasy. Um, what people are getting on the streets, what people are doing in raves, may or may not have MDMA in it. Oftentimes it doesn't. Um, what we're using in MDMA-assisted psychotherapy research is pure, pure MDMA made by a chemist in a lab. I was extremely skeptical. I mean, I, it's kind of laughable to think that this thing would have anything and it could do much more than anything than like the eight other people, professional therapists may have tried before me. People with PTSD have nervous systems that are totally shot. So anything can set them off, anything can trigger them because they're so activated all the time. They're living in the part of the brain that's meant to just protect us from danger. You can't talk through that, you can't just think your way out of it, which is what traditional therapy would, would work with. So in an ordinary state of consciousness, someone would talk about, think about the trauma, and they would dissociate, they would check out, they would get numb, because it's too intense to think about. And MDMA supports them in looking at it and staying with it long enough to actually process it. They wanted me to take the medicine and kind of let the medicine guide the experience. And I'd take it, lay down, and as soon as it started to kick in, I'd kind of just start verbalizing my thoughts and start kind of wading through the waters of my, of my subconscious and my PTSD. <sighs> You're expanding a consciousness that you can heal your, heal yourself, you know, from the inside out, and it, and it does seem to introduce yourself to your, sort of your pains or your memories of trauma, like what could be the causes of these issues or what you blame yourself for, to remind yourself that, you know, you're not a sum of your mistakes. Each MDMA session was an instru played its own instrumental part in getting me and getting better. It was really amazing. The first session was identifying the problem. And then my kind of question leading into the second session was, you know, if I identify that, that problem, okay, cool, what now? I was kind of talking about what now, like what do I do after I've I identify these problems? And the third session was feeling that emotion and bringing that love outwards towards my family and friends and to the world and to the environment. Yeah, when it did work, that astonished me. Like when I noticed that my insomnia was gone, I didn't wake up in the middle of the night sweating, I mean, ever. Like, I didn't, 
Like I, I didn't have outbursts at all. No, there were there were no rage tendencies. It was a different it was a different kind of understanding on life almost. But with the MDMA, with that armor, and with that just it felt like love coming out of every single cell of my body. I was curious and I was wanting to make myself better. And with that armor on me, I could do any of that stuff. I could climb that wall and get over and access my heart and see what was, what that wall was made of, you know? And uh, yeah, it was really amazing. <laughs> Hearing what he was talking about and then how he was trying to fix that in his life, like I was able to see him starting to kind of open up and be more able to communicate. And I think at that point, that's when I kind of let go of it, of all my bad stereotypes about it. We get prescribed SSRIs, uh, different medications and different treatments. It's a reincurring process. So you gotta take these pills daily or you gotta uh, go to these appointments every week, every month, what have you. But the interesting thing about these MDMA sessions is it's only three sessions, give or take, and that's it. From beginning to end of his time in this study, we saw a 75% drop in PTSD symptoms, which is just incredible. And and how many months, six months later, we're not seeing we're not see, seeing him creep back. It, it wasn't it wasn't born out of misery and suffering, and it, you know, I mean, it, a survival mechanism that was a necessary one. And, and I, at least negotiating at least that much, I'm able to move on with my life. So during the MD, MDMA sessions, I realized that to you know to get better to help myself, I don't need to like fireworks. I don't need to watch these war movies. You know, I expect so much to be James before deployment that I can just be James after deployment. I put an ad in, a, in Craigslist just on a whim. We happened to meet up for a coffee and happened to be in the same ex experimental program, basically, right? Yeah. <laughs> both in the Army, we both deployed to the same area of Afghanistan. Because, you know, it's really hard to digest these kind of experiences. So when you have someone to talk to, a, to that's like minded, that has the same kind of uh, experiences you do, and that's, that can empathize with you, it helps mold and shape those experiences to where. Uh, you know, you don't go too far out there, you know, you don't overlook something that could be very insightful. There's something they can understand that the rest of us just can't even comprehend. They get how, how deep trauma goes and they get how deeply healing psychedelics are. So they're, you know, I think they're each other's allies, they're brothers in a way. So a few months ago, Mark's mom passed away, and, and he was there, you know? He was there with her when it happened. He was there with her till the end, and I don't know if that would have been possible without, without the healing that he experienced to, um, to be so present with her when she needed him the most. Two and a half years ago, I would have just prayed for him to be able to actually like look at me and say, I love you, and actually be able to feel it and to know that he meant it. Today, I have so much more than that. <laughs>